Good evening, welcome. I'm Hobson Wildenthal, the provost of the University of Texas at Dallas and a member of our UT Dallas Physics Department. I am extremely happy to welcome to our campus and to the O'Donnell Building and Lecture Hall the participants in the 27th uh, meeting of the Texas Symposium on Relativistic Cosmology, uh, the 50th anniversary of the first meeting conceived and put on in 1973 by physicists of the precursor institution of UT Dallas, the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies. I also am very happy to welcome uh, community members who've come to hear this evening a lecture on the most exciting discovery in physics of the last several decades. And as a physicist, I'm halfway qualified to make that assessment. Uh, and the particle physicist can just have to take it. <laughs> For those of us who are not relativists, uh, not of a certain mature age, I'd like to take a minute just to emphasize the international importance of what has for 50 years been known worldwide as the Texas Symposia. Uh, long before I, as a physicist, had ever heard of the University of Texas at Dallas, I was aware, even though it wasn't my field, that the Texas Symposia regularly brought together the best minds in the field to discuss the latest advances in the field and really to define the future progress of the field of relativity and cosmology. So uh, those of you who are not uh, members of the relativity and cosmology community, I want to emphasize uh, that uh, this event we've been holding here uh, in Dallas and at UT Dallas really is uh, regularly the worldwide center of uh, research and thinking about these most fundamental topics. It's uh, gratifying to me, looking back, to realize that uh, our University of Texas at Dallas in its embryonic form of the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies really was uh, born and created concurrently with the first meeting of this uh, now historic international uh, succession of great scientific conferences. It was a, it was a great uh, send off for what has become UT Dallas. I'm very, very proud and gratified to my physics department colleagues, Mustafa Ishak and Wolfgang Rendler for them having the initiative and the imagination to suggest how appropriate it would be if UT Dallas were to be the host for this 50th anniversary meeting of the Texas Symposium. And I'm also gratified that the international community of scholars in this field uh, agreed with uh, Mustafa and Wolfgang and uh, took the necessary steps to make sure that the uh, 27th meeting would coincide with the 50th year anniversary and allowed us to host it here. In addition to Mustafa and Wolfgang, of course, uh, we all are grateful, uh, participants in the symposium and the rest of us, for the great support they have received from their colleagues, students, staff, and other faculty members at UTD. It truly takes a large family to put on a major event such as we've been enjoying, and uh, we're tremendously appreciative for everybody's great efforts. Now to introduce our speaker of the evening, it's a great pleasure for me, a great privilege for me, to introduce uh, my colleague Wolfgang Rindler, co-organizer of this symposium and a co-organizer of the first symposium 50 years ago. It's been a privilege for me for 21 years to be Wolfgang's uh, colleague in the physics department. And uh, uh, so it, it's wonderful once again to ask Wolfgang to come out and introduce our speaker.
Good evening. It has been the uh, tradition of these Texas symposia always to uh, put forward one of its members to give a public lecture. And uh, we are particularly happy that this year Professor Cobb stepped forward to uh, undertake this task. Uh, so it is, in fact, my great honor and pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Cobb to you. To many in the audience, uh, of course, such an introduction is completely unnecessary because they know him so well anyway. But I'll uh, tell you who may know him less about him. Professor Rocky Cobb is one of the very distinguished cosmologists associated with the University of Chicago, where he is, in fact, the Arthur Holly Compton Distinguished Service Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and also the chair of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. In 1983, he was the founding head of the Theoretical Astrophysics Group of Fermi Lab, which is associated with the University of Chicago. And in 2001, he also became the founding director of the Particle Astrophysics Center there. He has published over 200 scientific articles. His book, The Early Universe, co-authored with Michael Turner, is practically the handbook of particle physics these days. Along with his co-author, Turner, he won the 2010 Heinemann Prize for astrophysics, honoring the pair as among the main founders of the discipline of particle astrophysics. He also wrote a popular book entitled Blind Watchers of the Sky, which earned him the Emmy Award from the American Astronautical Society. The list of his prizes and medals uh, goes on and on, and I'll just mention one more. That's the Ersted Medal, which is the highest award of the American Society of Physics Teachers. As I mentioned, Rocky Cobb is one of the founders of particle astrophysics, a term that no one had even heard of 30 years ago. Whereas in 1963, or let's say whereas 1963 saw the entry of general relativity into astrophysics, which the Texas Symposia, in fact, have celebrated ever since, about 30 years ago, there started another invasion of astrophysics, and that was the invasion of the particle astrophysicists and quantum theory. I imagine that perhaps in the not too distant future, our symposia will have to be called Texas Symposia, Texas Symposiums on uh, relativistic and particle astrophysics. Rocky Cobb is no stranger to these symposia. He organized the 1986 symposium in Chicago. He gave the public lecture at the 2008 Symposium in Vancouver, and just to throw it in, he got his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. So I feel in some ways we are triply related to him, and uh, I ask you to help me welcoming our wonderfully distinguished lecturer this evening, Professor Cobb. Thank you. thank you very much, Wolfgang, and thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening on uh, what in Chicago we would describe as a balmy evening in December. It's great to be back in the Lone Star State. It seems like only yesterday I left. At the meeting this week, people talk about time dilation and then I must have been traveling at relativistic velocities because it sure doesn't seem like 35 years ago I drove off to the West after graduate school. 
So it's very, I'm very glad to be back in Texas. Of course, Texas is famous for so many things. One morning last week, I took a scientific poll about what Texas is known for. I did this in the elevator of my condo going down to work, and I asked the seven people around what they associate uh, the word Texas with. Cowboys was an answer that some people said. Oil, football, people associate Texas with football. Pickup trucks, I got that. Fine cuisine, barbecue, Tex-Mex. <laughs> Some people mentioned the remarkable wildlife of Texas. My th thing that I associate with Texas is friendly people. The thing I miss most about Texas is the really friendly people here. Although I miss barbecue and armadillos, maybe not barbecue and armadillo, but uh, I miss many things about Texas, but it's really the friendly people. So this was the poll taken in the elevator of my condo. But if you would have taken the poll at a physics department anywhere in the world and asked them, what do you associate with Texas? They would say, relativistic astrophysics. Physicists identify Texas with relativistic astrophysics. 50 years ago, in 1963, was the first meeting of relativistic astrophysics here in Dallas. What is relativistic astrophysics? Relativistic astrophysics is the study of objects and the universe in regimes where Newton's theory of gravity is inadequate and one has to employ Einstein's theory of gravity, his theory of general relativity. There are places in the universe where you need relativistic astrophysics to understand what's going on. Places like in the vicinity of black holes. I went back and looked at the proceedings of the Texas Symposium 50 years ago. And um, I thought about 1963. Lyndon Johnson had been president for less than a month. A first class postage stamp was raised from four cents to five cents. The top song of 1963 was Sugar Shack by Jimmy Gilmer and the Fireballs barely beating out my favorite, Puff the Magic Dragon. In 1963, the top song in the United Kingdom was by a new group called The Beatles. It was She Loves You. The top movie of 1963 was Tom Jones, barely beating out my favorite, Son of Flubber, which was about a scientist. I can't understand why that didn't win. In 1963 was the first Texas Symposium. And since then, the Texas Symposium has been held throughout the world in places like Sao Paulo, Munich, Florence, Jerusalem, Chicago twice, Melbourne, Paris, Heidelberg, New York. And it's very appropriate that we're back here in Dallas for the 50th anniversary, the 27th Texas Symposium. 1963 was an exciting year in relativistic astrophysics. It was becoming clear that one had to use Einstein's theory of gravity to understand objects in the universe. In 1963, the distance, the, the fact that quasars are at enormous distances became obvious. And if they are very bright at enormous distances, they had to have an incredible power source. And it, be, it was becoming clear that the power source of quasars had to be black holes. So without relativistic astrophysics, you cannot understand quasars. In 1963, this was a coming out party for relativistic astrophysics. In hindsight, the importance of relativistic astrophysics could have been realized a dozen year, years earlier, but it wasn't until 1963 at the first Texas Symposium that it was realized. Another arena for relativistic astrophysics is Big Bang cosmology. There were no Big Bang talks at the first Texas Symposium. It was just six months after the first Texas Symposium that Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson saw the first evidence in their experiment 
of the uh, uh, radiation from the Big Bang. So there was an explosion of interest in the Big Bang in subsequent Texas symposia. So this sort of leaves us with the uneasy feeling that we never know what discoveries will revolutionize our field that are just around the corner, that are just ready to be made. Tonight, I will speak of a topic of great interest in Big Bang cosmology, the topic of the mysteries of the dark universe. There are two mysteries of the dark universe I will talk about. They go by names, dark matter and dark energy. There are phenomena that we see that we don't understand, and we have names for them, dark matter and dark energy, but naming is not explaining. What are these phenomena that lead us, uh, that we call dark matter and dark energy? Dark matter seems to pull things together, pulls together galaxies, holds galaxies together. Dark energy seems to push individual galaxies apart in the cosmic expansion. Dark matter seems to be an aspect of attractive, familiar attractive gravity, while dark energy seems to be an aspect of re, an impulsive, a repulsive aspect of gravity. Again, we don't know and we don't understand dark matter and dark energy. Otherwise, they wouldn't be mysteries. But we have plausible explanations for dark matter and dark energy. And our plausible explanation for dark matter and dark energy that I'll talk about this evening is that dark matter is a new, yet to be discovered species of elementary particle. And dark energy has something to do with the weight of space. Now, I am a cosmologist. This profession is often confused with the more popular profession of cosmetologist. <laughs> but they are different. One deals with the universe of makeup, the other with the makeup of the universe. <laughs> One profession is much more lucrative. We spend $39 billion a year in the US on cosmetology. I know this for a fact because I saw it on the internet. Therefore, <laughs> it has to be true. This is several hundred, maybe several thousand times more than we spend on cosmology. But one of the jobs of a cosmologist is to understand the makeup of the universe, the composition of the universe, to answer the simple question, what is the universe made of? And this um, pi diagram represents our understanding of the present makeup of the universe. In the universe today, there's a very small fraction that's in the form of radiation, 0.005%. Although the very early universe was dominated by radiation, the expansion of the universe has cooled the radiation, and today it's not very significant in the total makeup of the universe. This diagram also illustrates why chemistry is not important. <laughs> I don't understand why anyone studies chemistry. The chemical elements in the universe, the elements other than, other than hydrogen and helium, only comprise 0.025% of the mass and energy in the universe. There's a larger fraction of the mass of the universe in the form of elementary particles known as neutrinos. I'll talk a little bit about neutrinos later. Stars that astronomers have studied for thousands of years comprise a little bit less than 1% of the mass and energy in the universe. Most of the mass of the universe is in the form of a difficult to detect hot gas of hydrogen and helium that is to be found in clusters of galaxies. But if you add up everything that we see and understand and know about, know about it's only 5%. Only 5% of the universe we see. 95% of the universe is dark. We see evidence that it's there, 
but we don't understand its nature. We don't see it. 25% in the form of dark matter and about 70% in the form of dark energy. Now, I will talk about matter and energy on the same footing using one of the two equations I'll show this evening, the famous equation that everyone's familiar with, E equals mc squared. So I can talk about the mass equivalent of energy and the energy equivalence of mass. If we don't see it, how do we know it's there? How can we deduce that something's there that we don't see? And let me give you an example that has nothing to do with dark matter and dark energy about how we can deduce the existence of something without seeing it. Tomorrow, at about noon tomorrow, if you go up and look at the sky, you'll see these names written on the sky. <laughs> and you won't be able to see them, but there are planets out there. There are planets that you will see, Neptune, Venus, Pluto is not it's actually a planet, but I have it there anyway. The Sun, Mercury, Saturn, and Mars. The Sun, um, tomorrow at noon, will be in the constellation Ophiuchus. So if you were born between 30 November and 17 December, you are an Ophiuchian. Not Sagittarius or anything, you are an Ophiuchian. But if you look a little bit to the east of where the sun will be at noon tomorrow, this is the constellation Sagittarius. And if you look very carefully in that direction, look out 27,000 light years distance, and you will see the center of our galaxy. And when you look in the center of our galaxy, you will see if you're very careful and look for about 100 years, you will notice the orbits of stars, the motion of stars around the center of our galaxy. So this is an illustration, it's a cartoon, showing the orbits of stars over about 100 years around the center of our galaxy, around something that is providing a gravitational attraction, keeping these stars orbiting about the center of the galaxy. It is from measuring the orbits of these stars by measuring the velocity of things that we do see that we deduce there's something massive there that we don't see. And the massive thing that's there that we don't see is a four million solar mass black hole at the center of our galaxy. We don't see the black hole, but we deduce it's there by looking at the motion of other objects, by seeing effectively uh, measuring the gravitational force produced by this massive solar um, black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this is the way scientists and astronomers for over 80 years have deduced there's something funny, there's something dark in our galaxy. The story starts about 81 years ago. And uh, the astronomers express how dark something is by, by calculating the mass to light. They take the mass of something and divide by how much light it's putting out. So our sun is 2 times 10 to the 27 tons, and it has a luminosity of 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. So if you go up and look at the top of the sun, there's a little sign that says 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. So if you divide the mass by the luminosity, the sun, our sun, is 5 tons per watt. It takes five tons of star material to produce a watt of luminosity. Now in 1937, the Dutch astronomer Jan Oort measured the velocity of stars going in and out of the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. And in 1932, he deduced that the, our local neighborhood within a few dozen light years of our location in the galaxy was a little bit dim. 
you might have expected the same mass to light ratio as the sun, five tons per watt, but Oort determined that it was two or three times darker in our local vicinity than the sun. And he used the phrase to describe this, dark matter. There's some matter around that's dark. It's not producing light that he detected by measuring the uh, velocity of stars. Five years later, uh, the astronomer Fritz Zwicky determined the galaxy clusters were really dark at 2,500 tons per watt. Now, Fritz Zwicky worked at Caltech in California, but he was a Swiss citizen. His father worked in the Swiss Foreign Service, and he was actually born in Varna, Bulgaria. And if you go to Varna, Bulgaria, I know many of you go there often, you'll see a plaque where Fritz Zwicky was born that reads, in this home was born Fritz Zwicky, the astronomer who discovered neutron stars and the dark matter in the universe. Fritz Zwicky was an irascible character. He annoyed a lot of people, uh, but he was a famous astronomer. There's a plaque on the house where he was born. He was a student at ETH in Zurich, and uh, one time in Zurich, I went to the house where he lived in Zurich, he lived at uh, 17 Spiegelgasse in Zurich to see if there was a plaque on the house where he was a student in Zurich. And this big apartment house where he lived, there was a plaque. His next door neighbor in Zurich was Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> and the plaque says, here lived Lenin, the leader of the Russian Revolution. Although Zwicky caused a lot of trouble, he wasn't the biggest troublemaker <laughs> that lived in this particular apartment house where he was a student. So this idea that there's dark matter around was sort of known in the 1930s, but it wasn't taken very seriously by physicists. And it wasn't taken that seriously by astronomers. They scratched their head and they said, well, there's something we don't understand but it wasn't at the forefront of either astronomy or physics. This situation seemed to change after the first Texas Symposium in the 1970s, when astronomers like Vera Rubin and Kent Ford and others measured that individual galaxies are also dark, and on the outer edges of galaxies like our Milky Way, the mass to light ratio is about 300 tons per watt. 60 times darker than our sun. So what Vera Rubin did was to measure the rotational velocity of stars about the center of the galaxy and deduce the mass that's interior to the orbit of the stars. The same way we determine or deduce that there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Vera Rubin determined that the stars are moving so fast that there must be more mass associated with the galaxy than just expected from stars. And this discrepancy, something causing uh, stars to move faster than they normally would, we, de we describe as dark matter. The story continues, the evidence is getting stronger. In the past 10 years ago, there have been uh, dwarf observers. The dwarf observers who observe local dwarf galaxies in the vicinity of our Milky Way, and these dwarf galaxies are 15,000 tons per watt. There's a lot of mass and very little light. Most of the mass in these dwarf galaxies, almost all of it, is dark. Now, there are various ways to determine the distribution of dark matter. But when we look at a galaxy, we only see the light. We don't see all of the mass. So there are beautiful images of galaxies taken by telescopes and astronomers. This is an example. I don't know the name of this galaxy. We'll call it Fred. So if you look at Fred now, you're only seeing the light, 
but there's much more, there's dark matter. So if you back up and look at the galaxy, and you would be able to see the dark matter, the galaxy that you do see would just be this yellow flattened disk in the center, but it seems to be surrounded by a halo of matter that we don't see. And the density of the matter is red where it's very dense and then less dense and less dense. And this seems to be clumps of dark matter around. This is what a galaxy really looks like, if you would see the dark matter. What is the nature of this dark matter? What is the missing pieces, the nature of the missing pieces of the galaxy that we don't see? Well, this has kept me employed for the last 35 years. <laughs> On a good day, I can think of three ideas before breakfast. Most of them are rejected before lunch, but occasionally some are published. There are various ideas for the nature of dark matter. One idea is that Einstein didn't have the last word on gravity, or maybe Newton's idea of dynamics has to be modified. This goes by the name of modified Newtonian dynamics. Our, um, the fact that we deduce there's dark matter is incorrect because somehow Einstein's theory of gravity is incorrect, or Newton's theory of dynamics is incorrect. I don't think this is the answer. There are some people who work on it. It has to be explored, but I don't think it's the answer. Other ideas for the nature of dark matter is that dark matter is just normal matter that's in the form of some astronomical object that is not emitting much light. Uh, like planets. There are different types of planets. There are gas giants, ice giants, and my personal favorite type of planet, the rocky planets. You gotta like the rocky planets. We know also that there seem to be rogue rocky planets in the galaxy that are not associated with stars. Maybe the dark matter is just a bunch of rocks that's not emitting light. Or it could be that the dark matter is just stars that are too little to put out much light, little dim stars. Or people have proposed that the dark matter is big black holes. Black holes do not emit light. Together, rocky rogue planets, little dim stars, and big black holes go by the name of massive compact halo objects, or machos. So there was this idea that was very popular that the universe is dominated by machos. Yeah. Machos run our galaxy. Later experiments seem to suggest, and I think show, that in fact this is not the answer. So what's left is the idea that the dark matter is a new, yet to be discovered, elementary particle species. Now, why do I say a new particle? We have so many known particles that we know about. In fact, they're so standard, they go by the name of the standard model. There are quarks and leptons and anti-quarks and anti-leptons, force carriers and the Higgs, et cetera. And uh, the Higgs, of course, was discovered, with the discovery was announced in Switzerland on July 4th, 2012, although it should have been discovered 10 years earlier at the SSC, which should have been built in wa Wax near Dallas, <laughs> but unfortunately it wasn't. So what's wrong with these particles? We have a lot of particles. Why can't some of them be, be the dark matter? Well, the dark particle must be stable and massive and interact weakly. So let's get rid of all the particles that are not stable. That gets, gets rid of a lot of them. The particle must be massive. Let's get rid of the particles that are massless. That's the force carrier. The dark particle also must, must be massive enough although neutrinos are elementary particles that 
are weakly interacting and have mass, they don't seem to be massive enough, so let's get rid of neutrinos. Finally, the dark particle must interact weakly. Electrons and their antiparticles do not interact weakly. Quarks do not interact weakly, so we have to get rid of those, and there's nothing left. So this leads us to assume that this new species is a new type of particle, a weakly interacting massive particle, or a wimp. Could it be that wimps dominate the machos and that our galaxy is dominated by wimps? This is something that a lot of physicists find very attractive. Now, weak has a technical meaning associated with the fundamental forces. Uh, these are the fundamental forces, the strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force keeps new quarks inside of neutrons and protons, bind neutrons and protons into atomic nuclei. The electromagnetic force you're familiar with is always the high school experiment where they take cat fur and rub it on amber and you see the electrostatic force. Or you can do it at home. The repulsion of two cats that you rub together <laughs> is the electromagnetic force. The weak nuclear force involving neutrinos, a neutrino is a particle like an electron if you went in with a very tiny pair of tweezers and pulled out the electric charge. And the gravitational force, the force that causes apples to fall to Earth. Uh, we think that the dark particle is a wimp and has forces and masses associated with the weak nuclear force, the weak scale, which points to a mass scale of about 100 times the proton mass. And a large mass to produce the wimps require a large energy. Where in the world, or in the universe, can we find enough energy to produce the WIMPs to be the dark matter? The only place that we know to do it is in the earliest moments of the Big Bang. The Big Bang theory states that our universe emerged from a state of high temperature and density. 13.82 billion years ago last Tuesday, and is expanding and cooling, evolving and, and dynamic. The early universe was hot. That is the Big Bang theory. Is it just a theory or should we consider it a fact? Just because something says theory doesn't mean we should consider all possibilities. Gravity is just a theory. But when I walk to the edge of the stage, I don't consider all possibilities. <laughs> the theory, the idea of a theory, there's two meanings for theory. From the Oxford English Dictionary, the first sense of theory is a hypothesis that has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment and is propounded or accepted is accounting for the known facts. Example, the Big Bang Theory, the theory of evolution. There's theory in sense two, which is a mere hypothesis, a speculation, conjecture, an individual view or notion, like the Obama birther theory. But the Big Bang is more than just a theory, it's a television program. <laughs> Many of you see this. You probably think it's a comedy, but to a physicist, this is reality television. <laughs> the Big Bang is more than a theory because it has been confirmed. It's been validated. The Columbia Broadcasting System has validated the Big Bang theory. In addition to CBS validating the Big Bang Theory, astronomers have validated the Big Bang Theory. The main idea of the Big Bang is that the universe changes in time, it evolves. How can we tell that the universe evolves? 
astronomers can directly observe the evolution of the universe, the fact that the universe is different now than it was billions of years ago by using time machines. The time machines that astronomers use are telescopes. When you look out in space, you look back in time. The farther away something is, the younger it appears because the light that it has emitted has been traveling longer to reach you. Usually the people in the back of the auditorium look a little younger to me <laughs> than people in the front of the auditorium. In the back there, you look about 100 nanoseconds younger than people in the front. If you want to appear young, don't stand close to someone. Stand farther away. As we look out in space, we look back in time. When we look through telescopes, we can see snapshots of the universe at different stages of its evolution. And looking through telescopes gives us the validation of the Big Bang Theory. So we think that the dark particle, if that's the dark matter, the WIMP was made in the Big Bang. Now, no one can really say they know anything about the nature of dark matter. However, there are some people who come to tell me they do know about the nature of dark matter. As chair of astrophysics on the south side of Chicago, people would barge into my office unannounced and tell me they know the nature of dark matter. These were weird looking people. People with scary big Michel Bachmann eyes. People who were sloppily dressed with indifferent personal hygiene. I wanted to help these people. But I was told they have a pre-existing condition a pre-existing condition that's so serious, it's not even covered by Obamacare. <laughs> the pre-existing th condition is that they are string theorists. <laughs> Very sad. They say there's no help for string theorists, but I have developed a 12-step program and the string theorists could become functioning, productive members of society and <laughs> cosmologists. But this is the crazy idea about dark matter. Don't look now, but invisible things are passing through you. A mysterious, invisible particle species is all around us. It's a relic of the first fraction of a second of the universe. And a few hundred million of them are in this room at any instant, flying around you at about a half a million miles per hour. About one million million of them will pass through you during this lecture, but you can't see them. You can't feel them. You can't smell them. And yet, they shape the large-scale structure of the universe. That is a fantastical story, an amazing story. So how can we see whether this amazing story is true, whether there's a new particle species that was made in the Big Bang? The title of my next book will explain that. My next book, Origin of Species. It's going to be a big seller. <laughs> These are four snapshots in the history of the universe. The bang, at time equal to zero, was the origin of space and time. In principle, it had infinite temperature. We don't understand the time of the bang. There's a lot of papers and discussions about that at the meeting this week. But if we look at when the universe was one billionth of a second old, when the temperature had cooled to 50 gazillion degrees, we think that this was the origin of the WIMPs. 380,000 years after the bang, when the temperature of the universe was about 500,000 degrees, is when the universe first became transparent. 
For the first 380,000 years, the universe was so hot and opaque, we couldn't see through it. So if we look with telescopes today, when the temperature of the universe is minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit, 13.82 billion years after the bang, we can look out in space back in time, but we hit a barrier because earlier than this, when we want to see the production of WIMPs, the universe was too hot and too dense to be transparent. So no matter how large of a telescope we build, we cannot look out in space back in time and see the origin of the WIMPs. We cannot see the primordial suit. We think that the WIMPs were produced in the primordial soup by collisions of quarks, antiquarks, electrons, positrons, croutons, all of the <laughs> particles in the primordial soup producing WIMP pairs. But we can't look out in space and back in time and see this, but somewhere on Earth we can make WIMPs today in a primordial soup factory. The primordial soup factory is accelerators. An accelerator is a primordial soup factory. Now, everyone's familiar with accelerators. You have, everyone's familiar with that accelerator in your car, but actually in your car there are three accelerators. An acceleration is a change of velocity, whether it's increasing or decreasing. The brake pedal is an accelerator. It causes a change of velocity. There's a third accelerator. An accelerator is a change of velocity, and velocity has a direction associated with it. So if you change your direction, you're accelerating. The steering wheel is an accelerator. There are three, every high school physics student knows that there are three accelerators in your car. I knew this when I was in high school, and this is why I failed my driving test. <laughs> the police officer said, put your foot on the accelerator and drive. I panicked, which accelerator? It turns out that steering with your feet means you don't get a driver's license. Who knew? Who knew? But these aren't the accelerators I'm talking about. The accelerator I'm talking about is a particle accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider that's in Geneva, Switzerland. Today, it is the world's most powerful accelerator. It's in a 17-mile circumference tunnel about 300 feet underground. You don't see the yellow ring. Uh, but to give you a sense of scale, this is the Geneva Airport. This is Lake Geneva back there. It's an enormous undertaking. The particle accelerator is a machine that accelerates elementary particles, like protons in this case, to velocities very near the speed of light, colliding them together and producing for a brief instant in a very small place in Switzerland, the conditions that were present in the universe a billionth of a second after the bang. And we build enormous detectors surrounding the collision area to analyze the results of the collisions. And physicists sift through the debris of the collisions to learn the ingredients of the primordial soup. There are known ingredients in the primordial soup, the quarks, gluons, electron-like particles, W's and Z's, blah, 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 and so forth. And we know the fraction, the percentage, of the primordial soup with these known ingredients. But there's also a secret ingredient that we're looking for that would be the dark matter. But looking for WIMPs in the particle collision is looking not only for a needle in a haystack, but you're looking for an invisible needle in the haystack because the wimp does not leave a track. It does not interact. It just passes through the detector. So how can we deduce that wimps are produced 
in the accelerator? How can we detect the existence of WIMPs? Well, we detect the existence of WIMPs the same way that we have um, deduced the existence of neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are weakly interacting. How do we deduce that neutrinos exist? Well, I'd like to talk about that. And what I brought along is a source of neutrinos in this bag. In this bag, this specially constructed bag, is a source of neutrinos, a radioactive source of neutrinos. So I'd like to see a volunteer to come up and help me with a demonstration. Here's one, here's one, here's a volunteer. C come on out. Your name is? Matthew. Matthew, stand over here. Matthew, hold this, this bag of radioactive neutrino sources. Should I have gloves? <laughs> you should, you should wear goggles and a hard hat. Now, slowly remove this source of neutrinos, this radioactive source of neutrinos. Be careful. Yes. Okay, so hold it up there. As you know, nutritionists tell you you should eat bananas because they provide 100% of the minimum daily adult requirement for neutrinos. A banana has about 500 milligrams of potassium. Most of the potassium is normal potassium-39. Hold it out a little bit. Okay, good. Thank you. It's upside down. Thank you. <laughs> but one part in about 10,000 of the potassium in there is potassium-40, uh, potassium which decays to calcium-40 with a half-life of about 12 billion years. Bananas are radioactive. When you eat a banana, when you eat, a little bit higher, little bit, when you eat a banana, you become radioactive. It was, we don't deduce, we don't measure the, as far as I know, no one's ever measured a neutrino coming from a banana, but we deduce that neutrinos are produced because of the decay of the, of the potassium, where a neutron turns into a proton and an electron. We can measure the proton and the electron, and they fly out of the banana. Maybe not all the way out of the banana, but if you have a potassium atom, you can see them flying out. But the proton and the electron are going in this direction, and there's nothing that's seen that balances the momentum going in that direction, so this led Wolfgang Pauli in 1913 to deduce that in beta decay, a neutrino is produced. We don't detect the neutrino, but we deduce it exists because it has to have something recoiling against the proton and the electron. Uh, let's give Matthew a hand. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, you, you, you can. I'll give you that. I do this demonstration in my class, but I can't get students to come up and do it. So I have a friend in the biological sciences, and he, he told me that when he does demonstrations, he uses lab animals. They're cheaper than students. <laughs> but that didn't work because the animal ate the demonstration. <laughs> Turns out that monkeys like bananas. Who knew? So this is the way we can detect WIMPs or deduce the existence of WIMPs in collisions of particles. We look for some particles spraying out in one direction with nothing recoiling against it. And if it's not a neutrino, if we can look at the properties of what happens and decide it's not a neutrino, then we would have deduced the existence of WIMPs. What kind of theory do we expect to produce WIMPs well, for many years, theoretical physicists have been talking about a new type of symmetry called supersymmetry. This was an idea that was developed in the early 1970s, a long time ago, but it's still of great interest despite the fact that there's been no observational evidence for it. 
In this theory, every known particle has an undiscovered partner, a superpartner, a supersymmetric partner. And the lightest supersymmetric partner should be stable. And in many realizations, the lightest supersymmetric particle is weakly interacting. And the lightest supersymmetric particle is a candidate wimp. Supersymmetry and dark matter are a natural match. If you go to physicsmatch.com, you'll see the following. I'm looking for a superpartner. A mature, elegant, 41-year-old theory, supersymmetry, is desperately seeking a species to develop a physical aspect. I'm weakly interacting. A weak, lonely, 35-year-old, wimpy particle species is seeking a theory in which to be embedded. <laughs> There's a very high degree of compatibility between supersymmetry and WIMPs. So we're looking for, for WIMPs at the Large Hadron Collider, at accelerators. It's also possible to see WIMPs the evidence of WIMPs by looking up in the heavens, in particular by looking toward our galactic center. Remember how WIMPs were made in the primordial soup. Particles we know about collide in a collision and produce WIMPs. Now this picture here is a crude type of a diagram that's known as a Feynman diagram named after the great American physicist Richard Feynman, who drove around Pasadena in this van with Feynman diagrams on the side. This is Richard Feynman. And this is an illustration of a Feynman diagram. Is Vince Sanchez here? No? Vince, you should have put these arrows going in the other direction. Now, I've learned, but it's a bad lesson to learn, you don't point out errors in someone's tattoo. You know, you don't say, shouldn't mother have an H in it? You know, that, that doesn't win friends. Uh, but this is a type of Feynman diagram. So what, if we look at this Feynman diagram that we think produced wimps in the early universe, then uh, Feynman tells us there are things we can do with this diagram. We can interchange these particles and if we produce WIMPs with the collision of particles that we know about, then WIMPs should be able to collide and produce particles we know about. So in the galactic center where there should be a lot of WIMPs, the relic WIMPs can annihilate and maybe produce X-rays, gamma rays, high energy electrons, positrons, neutrinos, protons, antiprotons, things we can look to the galactic center and see if they're being produced. Look for evidence of WIMPs in annihilation of in the galactic center. And there are a number of experiments in space and on Earth involving telescopes looking for this, these particles that would be produced by WIMP annihilation. These are generally in very inhospitable places where no one really wants to live, places like uh, space, the South Pole, Antarctica, Namibia, and Arizona. <laughs> There's another way we can look for wimps, and that's look for earthly wimps. We are swimming around in a sea of wimps that are around us. So let's look again at this idea that we produce wimps by the collision of particles that we know. And um, Feynman will tell us we can exchange these two particles. And what you would describe is the scattering of a wimp with a particle like a proton or a neutron or a nucleus. So we look for earthly wimps, wimps that are very weakly interacting, that pass through Earth and can go deep underground where a detector is shielded from cosmic rays and other types of radiation. A detector consisting of ultra-pure, ultra-cold, ultra-a ultra lot of things uh, that's very hard to monitor, looking for the possibility that occasionally, once a year or so, a wimp will pass through and occasionally nudge one of the nuclei 
producing ionization heat, light vibrations, bubble nucleation, something that you can detect. And there's probably a dozen or so, maybe 20 experiments throughout the world looking for underground, looking for these earthly wimps that are passing through Earth. And these are some of the experiments. And uh, the nice thing about this experiment is that physicists get to dress up in funny costumes. They wear hard hats in case a wimp hits them in the head. Gloves, bunny suits, and masks in case wimps smell bad. And they're looking for wimps underground. We live in a dark matter universe. If dark matter is a wimp, if this is the explanation, we today are on the threshold of discovery. The LHC will soon have sufficient energy to make wimps. The discovery will be tough. There's no indications yet. New satellites and telescopes finally have sufficient sensitivity to look for heavenly wimps in the galactic center. There are some anomalies that we don't understand that are seen. Some anomalies may even be the first evidence of WIMPs. Underground experiments finally have sufficient sensitivity for direct detection of WIMPs. Some anomalies exist there, and we may, in fact, uh, be seeing the first evidence of WIMPs. It's too early to tell, but we are in the threshold of discovery. This is the dark matter decade. This is the decade of the WIMP. In this decade, we will know whether this is the answer. I said that last decade also, but now I'm really sure. Of it. <laughs> but there's yet more to the dark side than simply dark matter. There's dark energy. And this is also a crazy story. This story is the following. You can't put it on a scale, but nothing weighs something. Empty space, completely empty space, has a mass density of 10 to the minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter. Larger than naive theoretical estimates done by other people who are naive theorists by a factor of 10 to the 120, it dominates the universe's present mass energy density, pulling space apart, causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate, and it will determine the ultimate fate of the universe and we don't understand it. To understand how empty space can weigh something and how we deduce that dark energy exists, we have to start with our concept of space and time. In our everyday experience, we have a concept of space and time that is a classical concept in space and time going back to Isaac Newton. In Newton's great book, The Principia, he wrote about absolute space and absolute time. He wrote that absolute space remains always similar and immovable, and that absolute, true, and mathematical times flows without regard to anything external. In our everyday picture of space and time, space and time are out there. There's nothing you can do to change it. Time's going to continue to flow. Space is fixed. The distance between things that you don't move is fixed. You can't change it. This idea of space and time was overthrown at the beginning of the 20th century by the work of Albert Einstein. In 1905, he showed that space and time are not independent, but space and time are relative, not related to each other, not relative like cousins, but you know, the difference of space and time is relative and that gravity is related to the curvature of space, that massive objects can curve space. This allowed the development of our first scientific view of cosmology, our first scientific model of cosmology, based upon Einstein's theory of gravity. And since this is a conference on relativistic astrophysics, I have to show Einstein's equations that describe his theory of gravity. Because this really is the theory of modern genesis, the Einstein equations. Now, it's an equation. And like every equation, it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. 
The left-hand side of Einstein's equations describes space and time, curvature of space, the expansion of space. Space and time is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is mass and energy, particles and forces. So Einstein's theory of gravity is that space, uh, that uh, matter and energy distort space, and it's the distortion of space that causes objects to move in a way that we deduce is a gravitational field. So there's a relationship between space and time and mass and energy. Einstein developed this equation in 1915, and one of his first applications was to cosmology. He knew he had a powerful new tool that he could use to understand the universe. Einstein expected that the universe does not expand. He expected to find a solution to his equations that described a static universe. He was dismayed to discover there is no solution to his equations as he wrote it to describe a static universe. Now, he could have, at this point, said, aha, the universe must expand. I'm going to predict the Big Bang. But he did something else. He added a term to his equations to prevent the universe from expanding. And this term he added to his equation was called by Einstein a cosmological term. He did this in 1915. And the past 90-something years, we've had a great advance in developing a completely new name for it. We now describe it as dark energy. So Einstein produced, in some sense, the first scientific theory of cosmology. And this was a theory that was the theory of cosmology from 1917 to 1929. Einstein had three basic ideas. Gravity shapes the universe, gravity is curved space, and the universe is static and timeless. It doesn't expand. I think for the first time, cosmology becomes a science. One of the hallmarks of science, perhaps the most important hallmark, is that ideas, theories, and models are falsifiable. So the idea, the theory, and the, the model of the greatest scientist of the 20th century, maybe one of the greatest scientists of all time, was falsified by a basketball player. Not any basketball player, but a basketball player on the last decent athletic team of the University of Chicago, <laughs> the 1909 National Championship basketball team. The starting forward on that team you've heard of, that was Edwin Hubble. After his basketball career, Hubble went on to discover that the universe expands. Einstein was wrong. But in the past 10 years or 15 years, our view may have been, uh, our view is that Einstein's idea that he, that of the cosmological constant perhaps was not wrong because we have discovered, astronomers have discovered the acceleration of the universe. Hubble's law that he discovered in 1929 relates the velocity of the expansion of the universe today. But in the 1990s, we were able to look farther out in space, further back in time, and measure the expansion velocity at earlier times. A difference in velocity is acceleration. Physicists and astronomers expected the expansion of the universe to decelerate, to slow, because gravity pulls everything back together. And the surprise was that was not the result, that they measured that the universe is expanding at a faster and faster and ever-increasing velocity. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. This was such an amazing, surprising discovery is that in, that in, 19, in 2011, the Nobel Prize were given to three of the leading astronomers on teams that discovered the acceleration of the universe. So was Einstein right after all? In 1917, he proposed a cosmological constant. 
In 1929, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe, so the original reason Einstein proposed the cosmological constant was not true. And in 1934, Einstein said that the introduction of the cosmological constant was my biggest blunder. He didn't know that 64 years later, astronomers would find evidence for a cosmological constant in the accelerated expansion. So what's the lesson here? Never admit you're wrong. <laughs> Einstein could have become famous. <laughs> but he said he was wrong, and he has been forgotten. <laughs> Einstein's cosmological constant is equivalent to a mass density of empty space. It is the unbearable lightness of nothing. Empty space, if this is the explanation for the acceleration of the universe, has a density of 10 to the minus 30, I think I have the correct number of zero, grams per cubic centimeter. Your density is about one gram per cubic centimeter. Some people denser than others. Um, but space has an incredibly small density. This is known as the cosmological constant. And the puzzle is that it's so small and yet not zero. So to me, it's not the cosmological constant. I think it is the cosmoological constant because it's so small and yet not zero. How can nothing weigh something? So what I'd like to do now is to talk about the six secrets of nothingness. This is the Zen part of this lecture. <laughs> the six secrets of nothingness. Nothing is uncertain. Uh, I usually wear my Zen robes, but I left them in Chicago. Nothing is something. Nothing has energy. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is mysterious. And nothing matters. Nothing is uncertain. This goes back to the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics proposed by Heisenberg, that there is a fundamental uncertainty in energy and that for a brief period of time you can violate conservation of energy. So what I ask my students to do is to close their eyes and to think about nothing. Some of them are really good. Really, they've been practicing the entire term. So you can imagine, imagine nothing, a region of space where there's no matter and no radiation. You can, in principle, remove all of the matter and radiation, but what you can't remove is uncertainty. This means that at every point in space, it's possible for a particle and antiparticle to come out of the vacuum, exist for a brief instant of time, before annihilating and disappearing back into the vacuum. So if you would see nature with some microscopic eyes, it wouldn't be a quiescent vacuum. The vacuum would be bubbling with particles and antiparticles and oscillating fields. Nothing is uncertain. So this is just a computer animation showing nothing being uncertainty. Fields changing in time. Nothing is something. Nothing also has Higgs energy, here illustrated with the Higgs bison discovered at Fermilab. According to the Higgs, and he's getting the Nobel Prize yesterday, I guess, the quantum vacuum has a potential energy, a Higgs potential energy, and this Higgs potential energy field in the vacuum everywhere in space, and nothing gives mass to electrons, quarks, and other particles. That's a tremendous amount of energy. The Higgs potential energy at every point in space is 246 billion electron volts. Nothing is hidden. My friends who are string theorists tell me that at every point in space, there are little bitty dimensions, extra dimensions of space that are wound up really small. That's not true. I don't have any friends who are string theorists. 
But if I did, if I did, they would tell me that every point in space has extra dimensions. There must be some energy in these hidden dimensions in space. Nothing is mysterious. The cosmological constant is so small and yet non-zero. There are three plausible predictions for the cosmological constant, the energy density of empty space. One prediction is that it is infinity, not just infinity, but infinity to the fourth power. That's much larger than what's seen. My friends who are qu in quantum gravity, I don't have any, but if I did, they would say, no, 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 the energy density of empty space is 10 to the plus 90 grams per cubic centimeter. That's much better, but still off by 120 orders of magnitude. And if you believe in supersymmetry, then there might be a reason that the energy of empty space is 10 to the plus 30 grams per cubic centimeter, except the sign's wrong, so you're off by 60 orders of magnitude. Nothing is mysterious, and finally, nothing matters. Dark energy, or a cosmological constant, if it exists and it stays around, will determine the ultimate fate of the universe. If there's only dark matter, then the universe will either expand forever decelerating or reach a maximum volume and then collapse into a big crunch. If dark energy is dominant in the expansion, the expansion will be forever and the universe will expand forever, ever accelerating. Nothing is something. Nothing has energy. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is mysterious. And nothing matters. So the takeaway message from the lecture this evening is that 95% of the universe today is a mystery dark matter and dark energy. Now I said that I think that modern cosmology, scientific cosmology, started with Einstein. And Einstein, according to Time Magazine, which was the person of the 20th century, I often scratch my head and say, what would Einstein say if he knew in the year 2013, 95% of the universe would be a mystery. I think he would be happy. Einstein said the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. To Einstein, it was the source of all true art and all science. He thought those to whom this emotion is a stranger are as good as dead, their eyes are closed. Cosmologists today, are no stranger to mystery. 95% of the universe is a mystery. This is our mystery. It's the question for our time, the nature of dark matter and the nature of dark energy. I don't know whether or when we will understand the nature of dark matter and dark energy, but I'm confident that we will. Someplace out there, maybe in Plano, Nobody knows. There is a child <laughs> who will be the Einstein of the 21st century. Someone who will look out in space and back in time and understand the nature of dark matter and dark energy. The person of the 21st century will solve our cosmic riddles, our cosmic mystery, mysteries, and more importantly, develop their own cosmic mystery. Thank you very much for coming out this evening and your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cobb. I know this must have stimulated our appetites for still more knowledge about the mysterious. We've actually planned on satisfying those appetites outside the auditorium. There are armed bands of physicists, armed with knowledge and enthusiasm, uh, waiting and eager to discuss these matters 
at length with you as we leave the hall. So please uh, visit our armed bands of physicists uh, and learn more about the mysteries of our universe. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and I want to give Professor Cobb one more round of applause.